He does not think in days or months or years. It's part of the ethic of Islam. It's not philanthropy. It is the extraordinary sense of humanity that he has. Trust in people. It's, it's an extraordinary phenomenon of development that the most powerful force is people changing their own environment. Once known as Karim Shah, now as the Aga Khan, His Highness is the spiritual leader of the Ismaili Muslims, a community from the Shia branch of Islam. He is the 49th Imam, descendant of the Prophet Muhammad. Ismailis, like all Muslims, believe Muhammad was the last revealed Prophet of God. His Highness the Aga Khan is the 49th hereditary Imam of the Shia Ismaili Muslim community. Uh, this position that he holds, this office that he holds, is an office by which from the time of the Prophet to Imam Ali in succession uh, is the office of the Ismaili Imam. Today it is the office held by His Highness the Aga Khan uh, for the Ismaili community. Most of the Ismaili faithful community came to Africa from the Indian subcontinent in the late 19th century. They came to Africa when the British first brought in Indian laborers to build the railways in East Africa. Many Ismailis followed as traders at first settling along the Indian Ocean coast. They settled in much of Eastern Africa, Mozambique, Angola and South Africa and later on in West Africa. There is a long history that connects the Ismailis to Africa and in fact connects uh, Islam to Africa. It's interesting that the first refugees of Muslim history when they were being persecuted for their religious belief actually found refuge with the Christian ruler of Abyssinia, now Ethiopia. There has been immense prejudice surrounding Islam and this has increased over time with the acts of extremism as witnessed globally. But this is not a true picture of the religion. In fact, Muslims like the Aga Khan and most of his Ismaili followers embrace such teachings from the Quran as He created for you mates from among yourselves that ye may dwell in tranquility with them. Those who spend freely, whether in prosperity or in adversity, who restrain anger and pardon all men, for Allah loves those who do good. People know very little about Africa, people know very little about Muslim culture, civilizations, and within that vacuum, it's so easy to develop stereotypes that are based on current events. And I think partly when political problems are given a kind of religious, theological twist, then it compounds the understanding. His Highness has supported projects that have benefited Ismailis and non-Ismailis. His generosity to others has been driven by charitable tenets in the Muslim faith and his own sympathetic spirit when encountering situations where he can make a difference. In many parts of Africa, there are no Ismailis where we operate. The Aga Khan Development Network, for example, is very active in Mali, in Ivory Coast, in Burkina Faso. There are no Ismailis there. So the presence of Ismailis is not a criterion uh, that His Highness applies. He looks at the help that he can provide in working with the government. The mandate of the Imam is to engage with both the material and the spiritual conditions of not only the community but also those amongst whom the community live. So 
it does not have that sense of philanthropy and I think part of what is important is that this development has to be seen over time as something that builds sustainability and capacity in the community. It is part of the ethic of Islam, it is not philanthropy, it is that you have a duty to share what you do not need yourself. If Allah has given you the wherewithal to share, you share. Born in Switzerland, the Aga Khan spent some of his childhood in Nairobi, Kenya, away from the Second World War that was devastating Europe. It was in Africa many years later that he donned the mantle of his late grandfather, the third Aga Khan, Sir Sultan Mohammed Shah. Sir Sultan chose Karim Shah for the role, hoping that he will provide the Ismailis with energetic leadership. My grandfather was more the senior figure in the family with whom you discussed uh, what you were doing at school and not doing at school, what you were doing at university and not doing at university. And it was a very different relationship and he was very much the head of the family. For a 21-year-old college boy, an expert skier and soccer player for Harvard University, becoming the leader of 15 million Ismailis around the world was a huge responsibility. After visiting various Ismaili communities, the young Aga Khan returned to Harvard to prepare himself to meet the challenge. In 1959, he graduated from Harvard University with an honors degree in Islamic history. At this point, the Aga Khan returned to the continent. He met many East African leaders, including Kenya's founding father, Jomo Kenyatta. He even received the Grand Cross of the Brilliant Star of Zanzibar in 1957. But he also received similar recognition in the West African countries of the Ivory Coast and Upper Volta, which was later renamed Burkina Faso in 1965. His strongest relationships was with the independence leaders and the leaders who, were, who followed independence to start to develop the country. And that at that time of uh, in the pre-independence and independence, uh, even during colonial rule, he started to think about what would Africa need post-independence. These needs would form the basis for his development ideas, which would coalesce over the next four decades. They would include an emphasis on education, health care, infrastructure and self-reliance. As the Quran says, that man can have nothing but what he strives for. We're moving towards independence, towards the idea that we would be free to choose what kind of society we live in. And yet at the same time, we were aware that the colonial legacy had not left us with too many assets. The Aga Khan saw that Africa would have to build itself up as the colonial powers had only built institutions for the wealthy few. So the beginning was a complex learning process with leadership that one didn't know oneself, the leadership of the generation of my grandfather. These were all situations that I, I, I entered rather young. And I think the great challenge for him as Imam was to see how the community could become a catalyst in this environment for really generating the quality of change and quality of life uh, for the people of East Africa as a whole. His grandfather, Sir Sultan Mohammed Shah Aga Khan, was a distinguished statesman who was once the president of the League of Nations. He had assembled the beginnings of a worldwide development team which evolved into what is now known as the Aga Khan Development Network or AKDN. The new Aga Khan plunged into third world matters with great zest, continuing his grandfather's commitment to the social and economic progress of the Ismaili community. The Aga Khan Foundation provides a number of uh, services and interventions from agriculture and market development, education, health, community development, 
community civil society development and the development of culture and heritage. Karim Shah would take a similar path to his grandfather, taking an international role. But he would complete his grandfather's benevolent ambition with the AKDN, not by taking an active political role. The Aga Khan Development Network doesn't compete with government. We complement government. We complement the work of government. We also don't like to replace the government. That is not our role. We're a private development agency, a set of agencies, a private development network, but our role is to complement what government is, to support what they're doing, to enhance what they're doing. It's important that the position of the Aga Khan Development Network is seen as an enhancer of the quality of life. Education is one area where the Aga Khan's personal experience taught him that quality could make a difference and build the capacity of people. Eyes over there. Good morning, good morning. Say good morning, His Highness. Good morning, His Highness. Please go on, I'm going to join the class. All right, welcome. <laughs> the first Aga Khan Academy was established a decade ago in the coastal port city of Mombasa in Kenya. Two other academies are now operational in Hyderabad in India and in Maputo in Mozambique, with 15 more on the drawing board. Being a Harvard alumnus, it is no wonder education is key amongst his developmental projects. Intellect is a very, very powerful force. And uh, that has been there since uh, centuries and therefore the human intellect as a, as a force is, is something which I am very, very uh, admirative of and respectful of. Therefore, educating people to address issues is, is, a, is, a, is a fundamental principle of development for me. Here, students are accepted without regard to race, religion, gender, family background or finances. They learn to live together and accept and appreciate their fellow students. In other words, they learn to build a pluralistic society in the future. Nafisa Abdul Hamid earned a scholarship to the University of Alberta, Canada. She is one of the many budding professionals the Aga Khan School has produced and has plans of returning to her home country, Kenya. In the future, I want to go to law school, but not to make a ton of money, but to come out with a degree and to be qualified to go back to my home country and help the refugees in northern Kenya just go back to their homes. And here, as in all his undertakings, the Aga Khan refuses to cut corners or accept second best. Our hallmark will be quality students, quality instructors, quality facilities, an unwavering devotion to world-class standards. Let the day be long past when some could excuse mediocrity by saying that it was good enough for Africa. Maxwing Oswang's family struggled to take him to school. His future did not seem bright because of the limited resources both at school and at home. We have two rooms, and this is the sitting room, and we also have the bedroom where we normally cook also at the same time. He excelled and was admitted to the Aga Khan Academy in Mombasa on a visit to his old school. Since I've gone to Aga Khan, I think uh, I've started like seeing my, my dream coming true because uh, at the moment I think I'm, I'm doing well in my studies, and so I can see that I'll be able to go to universities whereby if I if I achieve my, my goal, I'll be able to come back and uh, help the school and also the community around there. With Max Swin, I don't think that he would have gone far because the father had already been retrieved. He's at home and there are also some of his brothers. They are trying, but still they have not settled at all because of finances. We are a public school. We are using uh, all government regulations and what 
we have our limitations. We have very little opportunity to train uh, pupils for leadership. Through my interaction with the Akana Academy, I've seen that the children are taught literally everything. They are training world leaders who will go back to their society to make a change. And I feel that is a very, very noble idea. As a world traveler, the Aga Khan has seen both the latest innovations in the developed world and the lack of infrastructure in developing areas. In Africa, he has eyed projects to improve local conditions for decades, often regardless of political situations. One good example of this is in Uganda. The Aga Khan's infrastructure operations arrived here during the rule of Idi Amin. Soon afterwards, in 1972, Amin expelled 50,000 Asians, including the Ismailis, and gave them a 90-day notice to leave Uganda. Dr. Vali Jamal, though only a boy then, recounts how Idi Amin expelled the Asian community from Uganda. People were afraid. He shot from the hip. He literally shot, had, sh had shot people, but not Asians. So we knew that this is an impulsive person and there was an agenda that was not going to tolerate Asian wealth uh, to the extent that was there. Because of the relations he made over time with leaders from various countries, His Highness the Aga Khan managed to assist the expelled Asians to settle in other countries. If you speak to uh, the uh, East African, uh, Ugandan Asians in Canada, they will tell you how uh, when the Ismailis were, uh, were leaving because of what the Aga Khan had arranged uh, with the then Prime Minister uh, Pierre Trudeau of Canada, that there were many other Asians who also were able to go because of what he had arranged. He worked with various international agencies, with various foreign governments to uh, negotiate uh, transit for them. Amin is long gone. AKDN is still there. When uh, President Museveni uh, came to power, he asked the Aga Khan to come back. He said, I want you to come back. We're, you know, uh, we are sorry for what happened, but it's happened. But we want uh, the, uh, your members of your community, you, to come back. The Aga Khan continues to, to invest in Uganda. Bujagali is a big example of that. I mean, this is a massive project that provides electricity to more than half of Uganda and soon to parts of northern Tanzania and uh, western Kenya. The lack of electricity has long been a problem for Uganda's development. Frequent power blackouts in Uganda cause serious consequences that cost the business community gravely. We used to have power in two, three, two to three days in a week. There was no business. We had no choice just to close up and go home. Now a new hydroelectric project down the Nile at Bujagali is keeping the lights on and turning out half of Uganda's electricity at a lower cost. Without electricity, your quality of life is not going to improve. So that's a very important economic initiative, which has a huge uh, uh, impact on the development of the country, the quality of standard of living and the ability of people to in improve their economic uh, standing. Once again, the Aga Khan's focus on quality is evident. The $900 million project would involve the AKDN the Ugandan government and key U.S. investors who would tap experts to ensure the project's integrity. The approach of the Imamat has always been to respond to the development challenges and priorities of the countries in which it is engaged. Naturally, these priorities differ significantly from one country to another and from one region to another. It has often meant taking courageous but calculated steps to create opportunity 
in environments that are fragile and complex at the same time. Bujagali now employs hundreds of Ugandans while supplying electricity to tens of thousands of locals. People are being empowered. He does not think in days or months or years. He thinks things in generational terms. Because to have impact in the quality of life of people requires that you stay with this issue until you're able to eke out poverty and degradation. It's not a quick fix in his words. This is not a Nescafe solution. I'm very suspicious of what the Americans call the quick fix. I don't believe in it. I think that it's better to build cautiously and on sound foundations. So, uh, you know, it, it takes a lot of reflection. I mean, just to give you one practical example, I think the university hospital in Karachi took 12 years of planning and thinking before I was in a position to say, we go ahead. The AKDN's health initiatives have included village clinics, a renowned teaching hospital in Nairobi, Kenya, and now a $50 million heart and cancer center at the Aga Khan University Hospital here in Nairobi. These facilities are known for their high standards across East Africa. They have helped to develop local medical professionals as well as attract those working overseas to come back home. People come back if the work environment is compatible with their objectives. And very often that compatibility is not only monetary, it's actually more often, at least in, the, in this field, academic, uh, growth potential uh, in uh, professional contexts, and it's also the ability to bring the family back to the cultural context it was originally in. Dr. Harun Otieno trained in the United States and came back home to head the cancer program. Remuneration is obviously a factor, but uh, the li life in Africa or Kenya is not as expensive. Uh, being close to family is also a big, you know, big plus. And uh, the pace of living is also a little bit more comfortable. But at the same time, you, know, you also get a big opportunity to make a bit much bigger impact when you're working in Kenya than, for example, working out in the West. Other AKDN projects are private companies with activities that range from power to finance, leisure to aviation, pharmaceuticals to communication. These are companies that are designed to generate income. Profits are plowed back into projects to promote development. The philosophy of enabling people to take charge of their lives with economic independence. The AKDN spends an estimated $600 million annually on its projects. Some of the money donated by the Aga Khan, others coming from diverse sources. Obviously, His Highness the Aga Khan is one of the biggest contributors to this particular effort. Another is the partners that we have. So the uh, USAID, uh, the Canadian government, the Japanese government, the German government, the French government, the Norwegian government. Uh, all of these uh, are partners who support the work of the Aga Khan Development Network because they see the impact, they see the outcomes of that work. One such AKDN company is the Serena Hotel chain. The Serena Hotels and Safari Lodges were created to promote tourism in Eastern Africa and generate funds for AKDN. Its two dozen hotels and safari lodges have been built with local materials, local skills and care for local cultures and environment. His Highness the Aga Khan has shown the world how you can do economic development through preserving the, the environment. So each Serena Hotel is planned in a very environmentally sensitive way, how it's, uh, even in its design, the use of uh, natural light, the use of uh, natural ventilation, the use of natural materials, the landscaping. 
The Serena hotels only employ African staff, taking care of their welfare, health care, but more importantly, room to grow professionally. The Aga Khan Development Network worldwide has over 80,000 people involved in it. I would say about 50,000 are in Africa and the other 30,000 are outside Africa. At the Serena, visitors not only stay in the highest quality facilities, they also have peace of mind knowing they are not financing the exploitation of land or people. Because more than money, more than things, people are what it's all about. I'm a deep believer in the fact that if the environment is good, people live a better quality of life. Uh, they're more stable. Their children grow up in a better environment. Leaders all around the world recognize and have honored the Aga Khan for his work and dedication. The trust and gratitude many African leaders have felt for the Aga Khan is an important boost for the work of AKDN. We have been a dependable partner of Tanzania's and Tanzania's development. I commend His Highness for this remarkable contribution to our economy. donne l'opportunité de rendre un vivant hommage au guide spirituel que vous êtes et souhaiter qu'Allah le Tout-Puissant comble vos fidèles de sa grâce. The welcomes may take many forms. But wherever it is, there is no mistaking the enthusiasm. Trust in people. It's it's an extraordinary phenomenon of development that the most powerful force is people changing their own environment. What they need in, in many cases is the wherewithal to change, but the, the will to change, very often the capacity to change well because they live in their contexts. That's an extraordinarily powerful force. It's a continuous job. It's an unending job. And through it all, having seen him in many, many parts of the world and having talked to him at length on many subjects, there is one thing which distinguishes him, which is not in the buildings and not in the organization. It is the extraordinary sense of humanity that he has. Over 50 years later, the once young Imam has touched lives all over the continent, leaving a mark everywhere he sets foot.